During the Linear Kinematics Lab, we measured athletes' sprint performance using an accelerometer. We'll now take a look at how we can analyze this to get useful kinematic values. Let's start by removing the gyroscope channels so it's easier to focus on the accelerometer. The first thing we need to find is the start time. We can look at vertical or horizontal acceleration. This won't be the exact start time, but will give us a good idea of the onset of movement. Graph the accelerometer Y channel and double click on the horizontal axis. Use the axis format tab to zoom in on the area where movement is occurring. Scroll over the graph and identify the first peak. This should roughly correspond to the onset of movement. Next, we'll determine the Z accelerometer offset. We must make sure that we do this during quiet standing, not when in the start position, otherwise we'll be reading acceleration due to gravity. Find a nice flat spot during quiet stands and calculate the average value over that range. I like to type in the value as leaving it as a calculation can lead to errors later on in the analysis. To remove the offset from the Z accelerometer, we must subtract the offset value from each value in the accelerometer array. Make sure to use cache symbols to select exactly the cell with your Z offset value. Since the positive direction for our Z accelerometer was behind the participant, we must now negate the accelerometer in order to have positive values during our integration process. Next, we can determine the delta x, or time interval, of the accelerometer based on the sampling rate. To do this, we can subtract concurrent time samples from the timestamp column to determine how much time elapsed between samples. In our data, this number is presented in milliseconds. Keep in mind that when using these values, you must divide by 1000 to convert the time interval to seconds. We can then determine the average sample rate of the device and use this as our time interval. In our case, 64 samples per second. One reason we would choose this method is that the initial sample rate has spikes in the sample time which will negatively affect our integration. For ease of comparison with the timing gate data, we will also create a column for the real time. I'll add in our initial zero velocities, and then I'm going to clean up the data a little bit to make it easier for the rest of the analysis. Now we can crop out the data up to the point that we identified as the start time, in our case 1675. From the accelerometer, we're looking to calculate the athlete's velocity. We can do this quite easily using the Riemann sum method to calculate the area of the acceleration curve, which corresponds to the first time integral, or velocity. We will calculate the left, right, and trapezoidal Riemann sums, but first we need to understand what they represent. The left Riemann sum is the product of the time interval and all accelerometer values starting from time zero until the second to last acceleration value. 
For the write rule, we'll follow the same procedure, but this time we don't include the initial value. I'll indicate this by highlighting it in red. The write Riemann sum is the sum of the product of the time interval and all accelerometer values, starting from the first recorded sample after the initial value, and including all remaining accelerometer values. For the trapezoidal rule, we must multiply the time interval by the average between the current and previous acceleration, starting from time 1, just like in the right rule, and filling down for the entire column. Each of the columns we've calculated contain the area under the curve at each sample during the sprint. We need to sum the values from each column to get the Riemann sum over the whole sprint. To better visualize the performance, we can calculate the cumulative Riemann sum. We'll do this for the trapezoidal rule. If we graph the cumulative sum of velocity, we can now determine a more accurate start time as this will correspond to the accelerometer reading going from zero to positive acceleration. Now we can crop this section of data out, and we'll need to fix up a few of our formulae as they relied on the cell above, which no longer exists. Few of our formulae as they relied on the cell above, which no longer exists. Now that we have an accurate start time, we can move on to calculating displacement. We do this using the cumulative sum trapezoidal rule, but this time we're going to use the velocity as the input rather than acceleration. If we graph the displacement, we can see that we actually need to crop the end of the file as well, but we can do this near the end of our analysis. What we know from the timing gate data is that the performer actually took 8.28 seconds to complete her sprint. This time corresponds to row 533. Using this value, we can calculate our average kinematics, as well as our Riemann sums, rem remembering that we need to delete the value from the left method first which will be in row 533. As we scroll down to the point at which we've run 50 meters, we find that in this case, it's row 585. So you can crop everything after that point if you want, or leave it until the final step of the analysis. Now, let's calculate all of our kinematic values.
Finally, let's crop all of the data after our known end time of 8.28 seconds. We can then make graphs of the acceleration, velocity, and displacement versus time. At this point, we could also calculate the split acceleration and velocity corresponding to the split times we recorded with the timing gates. 